Firstly, I want to congratulate you for putting together such a very comprehensive report. I think it's, a, it's something that South Africa definitely needs to be able to reflect. Um, it's also something very fresh. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another um, industry video cast. And uh, today we are going to be talking about the SA automotive industry. And uh, I am fortunate to be joined by uh, Richard Rice from Kantar and uh, Mike Mabasa from NAMSA. And uh, today we're going to be addressing a couple of industry uh, issues as well as opportunities and uh, the headwinds that the industry faces. And Auto Trader just released its car industry report for the year ended 30th of June 2020. And in this report, uh, there is a deeper dive into the dynamic relationship of demand and supply and its impact on price and how dealership listings that successfully capture consumer attention position themselves for the future. And then we also have a short piece in the industry report uh, from Kantar, their consumer buying research. And according to Kantar, leading data insights and consulting company, uh, we need to focus on the customer like never before. Customers are now wanting to be well informed and prepared to ensure they can be in control of the situation as much as possible. And then we have a, uh, a piece and a Q&A by Mike Mabasa from NAMSA. And according to the uh, uh, to NAMSA and the CEO of NAMSA, Mike Mabasa, the new car sales in South Africa are expected to decline by 25% this year. He adds that new manufacturers and dealers are currently facing two cold fronts uh, and innovation will be key if these companies wish to future-proof their businesses going forward. So welcome, gentlemen. I'll uh, I'll give uh, each of you a chance to introduce yourselves because I probably don't uh, uh, give you uh, the benefits of your resume like you can. So Mike Mabasa from NAMSA, uh, you know, short introduction. Um, um, how long have you been with, uh, with NAMSA now? A couple of years? Well, George, I'm, I'm about to finish my 18th month uh, with uh, NAMSA. Uh, it's been a roller coaster ride uh, for the last 18 months. And I think, uh, you know, I couldn't have asked for a better, uh, you know, start and obviously introduction to the automotive industry. I think it has been a very interesting 18 months uh, to get to understand uh, exactly how the automotive industry works. Because remember, I'm, I'm coming in from the uh, aviation industry. So... My background, I'm a transport economist by training, and my background has mainly been in the aviation industry. I'm still involved, by the way, in the aviation industry. I'm chairman of the Air Services Licensing Council, uh, which is really licensing all our airlines um, you know, that are flying in South Africa, and we're managing all that. And uh, obviously with uh, COVID-19, we've obviously seen some challenges there and so on. And when the automotive industry approached me 18 months ago to, uh, to come in and to replace Nico Vermeulen, uh, I was first very reluctant to make the move, uh, but uh, I was finally persuaded to make, uh, you know, this important move. And I have no regrets. I think it's an amazing opportunity for me to be able to make uh, and contribute meaningfully towards the development and the growth uh, of the automotive industry. So it's been a, a very interesting 18 months and I'm, I'm having fun. That's lovely. And uh, um, I, I, uh, I uh, we have two things in common the first one is automotive and the second one is uh, is aviation i didn't know that you come from the aviation industry as a matter of fact um i'm a light sport pilot so i suppose i can't ask you to help me with my pilot's license um but uh, uh but aviation is another passion of mine besides automotive so uh um, you know, being with the uh, industry now for just under two years, I suppose it's been a baptism of fire for you because, uh, you know, we've uh, coming into the industry and then uh, hitting the headwinds of the economy and then um, and then also COVID-19. Um, and then Richard Rice from Kantar. Uh, Richard, you've also been with uh, with Kantar previously, TNS, uh, uh, for quite some time. Well, yeah, I've been at Kantar for about nearly seven years now. Um, previous to that, I was with a, a different research industry, but or re research um, business. Um, but I've always worked in the automotive industry. So since the early 2000s, um, so I've seen a bigger drop actually than a 25% drop. I've seen a 40% drop in 08, 09. Wow. Um, and we went through that. I mean, we, we got punished for that as, as well because we did so much automotive work. But I've worked with all the OEMs and um, pretty much I've worked very closely with NAMS over the years. Um, and it's a passion of mine, particularly from a consumer perspective. 
Um, and I also, what I really enjoy is the, is the whole interaction at, at an OEM level, but particularly at a dealership level, because I think that's where um, the really meaningful stuff happens from a custom point of view. Um, times have obviously changed dramatically in South Africa, both politically, economically, and now with COVID. Um, but I think the, the industry is mature enough to actually manage this um, and, and, and see themselves um, through it because they have weathered a number of storms in the, in the past. The only thing I don't share with you guys is, is aviation, although I think I did 40 trips to Joburg last year. Um, so I, I am well traveled. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I guess yeah. that's the case. All right, gentlemen, let's get yeah. straight into it. And uh, um, we're going to try and um, spend some time addressing some of the uh, some of the issues and uh, um, and goings on in the automotive industry as it stands today. So firstly, um, uh, you guys have had sight of the Auto Trader car industry report um, that we've just recently released uh, for the year ended 30th of June 2020. What were your main takeaways? Let's start off with Mike. What were your main takeaways? takeaways from the industry report and, uh, um, and, and and what are the things that you feel resonate with you? Yeah, George, thank you very much. Well, firstly, I want to congratulate you for putting together such a very comprehensive report. I think it's, a, it's something that South Africa definitely needs to be able to reflect. Um, it's also something very fresh. It's something different uh, to what we've seen and what we continue to see in the market, uh, which is very, very useful because it really gives us a sense uh, of what's happening in other areas of uh, the value chain, because the automotive uh, industry is a, it's a very huge uh, ecosystem, and we need to be able to, you know, focus on different areas of our ecosystem, uh, you know. And I think that report really helps us to be able to understand, uh, you know, certain dynamics that we, we under normal circumstances you would not have seen uh, in your in, in your normal uh, magazines or any other publication that we have uh, in the country. So I think well done to you and the team. Uh, for putting such a very comprehensive uh, report. So I think my view is that, um, you know, like I said earlier on, I think this report is very useful uh, and it really helps us to be able to understand a, a number of aspects that will help us to be able to make decisions uh, in the future. But also I think for us as NAMSA, uh, from a policy point of view, because remember NAMSA is a policy uh, driven organization where we look at what's happening in the market, we look at what's happening in other areas of our work, so that we can be able to approach government and, 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 and be able to assist in making sure that we're able to shift some of the policies that we have currently uh, you know, in South Africa and so on. And I think the report, without necessarily going into too much uh, details, and I'm sure our, our listeners and viewers uh, would obviously have uh, an opportunity to look at it as well. Um, I think from, from our side, uh, it will certainly be able to assist us uh, quite, quite tremendously in making sure that we're able to drive uh, some of the key policy discussions and, and, and viewpoints that we want to be able to, uh, to lift up. I think the second area for me, um, is, which is something that we are going to be doing quite very strongly, is to be able to make sure that we make that report also available to OEMs. Because I think OEMs, uh, they tend to obviously operate in their own bubble, um, you know, without necessarily understanding some of the dynamics on the ground and so on. So I think uh, we will obviously make that report available to them so that they can be able to understand and obviously have a, a, an appreciation of the bigger picture uh, in relation to what is happening uh, in, you know, in the environment that uh, impacts directly on their business. Uh, thanks for that, Mike. Appreciate it. And, um, you know, it is available publicly. You can go to uh, reports.autotrader.co.za and uh, download the report if you want to if you want to read it. I encourage everybody to do it. Um, and uh, uh, and and basically, you know, exactly resonating with what Mike says, the the objective of the report is to supplement what's already out there. Um, you know, Autotrader sits on uh, a vast amount of consumer search data with 400 million, 401 million search is being done on, on automotive vehicles for the last year and, uh, and and I think is representative and with with the South African economy being uh, seven point uh, just on seven percent of the economy coming from the automotive industry and 2.5 percent of that seven or should I say 2.5 percentage points of the seven percent being automotive retail I think this report supplements the retail environment uh, quite nicely and I know that Richard is passionate about automotive retail what were your main takeaways from the from the report uh Richard. Yeah, I think I think first to talk back to I want to talk back to two of Mark's points because I think he makes two very good ones and I want to take a slightly different view. Um, you know what we do see across all industries is that you, 
you, you've got to actually protect the industry itself first, and then you've got to fight for your share. Um, if you're not growing the industry reputation and the industry um, as a group, so NAMSA does a great job at that from a policy point of view, from getting the CEOs around the table um, once a month, um, not these days, but um, potentially, obviously virtually, but um, getting the industry to combine on certain issues is, is critical, both up and downstream. So it's not just the OEMs and it's not just the dealers. There's a, a vast system out there. And then to talk to that point as well, I think the report shows um, something of the groundswell of change, um, which is something we see reflected in consumers as well. Um, and I think it alerts the dealers, the OEMs, and pretty much everyone else in the industry to what is fundamentally changing in consumers' views. Um, and how do we as an ecosystem, because the digital space, which we've seen growing dramatically um, during this time, um, from a retail point of view, um, et cetera, et cetera, the digi digital space for the auto trade is far more complex and it is an ecosystem. It's a digital, we call it clicks and bricks. So you can, you can click as much as you like in auto. Take a lot is not going to arrive at your front door with, a, with your new 1600, whatever. Um, you, you've still got to have that dealer interaction. You've still got to have the finance interaction. There may be a trade-in. Um, it's very, very complex. And um, I think the, the report itself points to that complexity and to some of the brands and how people are behaving across different brands. And because we do see in tough times how people either will go back to the tried, tried and trusted, so the more um, traditional brands that have got a very strong and solid footprint in a, in a, in a particular market um, that, that exude a lot of confidence, but they're also shopping around more because suddenly there's not the same amount of, of, um, of um, finance available. And so we've seen two fundamental shifts, that, which I think the report is going to pick up, and I'm going to be very interested to see the next one to see how that, that shape has changed because it's going to change. I mean, I think this is just a very nice early warning that the industry and right across the board needs to be very cognizant of. Yeah, I mean, I uh, I totally resonate with that. Um, you know, in terms of uh, the, the the shape of that change, and you know, part of the report uh, is a, a COVID nineteen special feature, which uh, in which we try to extract some of the changes in behaviour of uh, of consumers, and uh, and and I think the next uh, couple of months is going to show um, either the the bounce back of those those search trends and um, and you know back to uh, uh, normal, but um, I'm inclined to think that uh, the world has changed permanently uh, you know for the foreseeable future and uh, and those uh, those search trends are going to are going to have shifted and I'm interested to see what those search trends are going to show and how consumers shop for cars um, and which categories they 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 shop in so um, so back to Mike, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the current headwinds that you referred to when we did the Q&A with you, and you said that the industry is facing two cold fronts at the moment. Um, and uh, coupled with the current downward trends of, of new car sales, um, explain to us a little bit more about those two cold fronts, Mike, and, and how you see the world of new cars uh, in South Africa. Well, look, I think the reality that we all have to embrace is that life will no longer be the same uh, again. And I think I agree with you that, you know, even post the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, um, I think we are certainly going to see an industry that is uh, completely transformed. Um, and when I say transformed, I'm not talking black and white, because I know that South Africans, normally when we talk about transformation, we normally default to you know, this black and white thing. And, and, and our view as NAMSA is that transformation is much wider and bigger uh, than just a, a color thing. So for us, I think, you know, the, the two call friends that we, we're talking to um, is, is, is really confirming that we are certainly not going to see uh, the same automotive industry uh, as we've seen in the last 100 years. In fact, we argue quite very strongly that the automotive industry is going to change faster in the next 10 years than it has in the last 100 um, so we, we're seeing a, a, some huge seismic change, changes uh, you know, in, the, in the automotive industry. Um, whether you're looking at it through the lens of what is happening now in the electric vehicle space, um, and also what you know, the lessons we've seen, uh, particularly in relation to COVID-19 specifically, because I think they are very valuable lessons. We have learned at least uh, you know, from, from, from an automotive uh, landscape uh, point of view in relation to some of the things that um, 
COVID-19 has, has taught us. I mean, if you take, for an example, the issues around manufacturing, um, you know, if you look at, um, you know, vehicle manufacturing in South Africa, 39%, for an example, of the components we have in our vehicles that are produced locally, um, you know, those components are manufactured here in South Africa. What COVID has taught us is that South Africa can no longer afford uh, to have such a very small threshold of components uh, mentioned locally, because we've seen a lot of manufacturers, uh, you know, taking a huge country, particularly during the lockdown. Some of them, in fact, even as we speak now, still cannot be able to bring into the country certain components. Uh, and, and, and some of them had to also reshuffle uh, a lot of their value chain uh, suppliers, because we, we relied heavily on China um, and on Europe, uh, for an example, on uh, many of our components, and we, we've seen now, for an example, a, 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 a refocusing uh, in terms of where we're getting some of those particular components uh, into the country. And I think what COVID has really done, it has also re-emphasized the importance of localization, uh, where we need to be able to localize, uh, you know, the production of many of our components uh, in the country as opposed to be uh, reliant on imports. Because currently, more than 60% of our components are certainly coming in uh, out of the country, which is not sustainable. Uh, and when you have a pandemic like we've just had now with COVID-19, uh, it obviously has a huge impact uh, on, 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 your, on your entire value chain. And then of course, the second one, it's really around uh, vehicle uh, you know, uh, sales and so on. And I think we've seen in the last seven years, a steady decline in terms of a demand, particularly for uh, new vehicles in South Africa. And I'm sure, and as, as the report, uh, George, you, you may have seen, uh, begins to, to remind us that the shift now is moving, you know, from, uh, you know, new vehicle sales into used vehicles and also secondhand vehicle uh, market. Um, and we've seen that decline of, uh, you know, uh, new vehicle sales uh, for the last uh, seven years or so. And I think what we now need to do is to be able to see what is it that we need to do to recalibrate, uh, you know, the demand for uh, new vehicles in South Africa and how do we stimulate the demand uh, for new vehicles in the country. Um, and I think we are having those particular conversations uh, not only amongst ourselves as the industry, but certainly with government uh, so that we can be able to see how best we can be able to reduce certain uh, costs. I mean, if you take for an example, a, a cost of a brand new vehicle, which is a luxury, a vehicle in the, in the, in the premium segment, 42% uh, of that uh, retail price goes into tax, uh, which is huge. I mean, if you, if you compare, uh, you know, with other many, uh, uh, countries around the world, South Africa's uh, tax burden uh, or tax incident on new vehicles is still, is still very, very high. And we need to be able to find a way to be able to reduce that uh, tax incident quite significantly from 42% uh, to at least below 20% so that we can really be able to begin uh, you know, to, to energize and to also stimulate uh, demand for new vehicles. Because at the rate at which we are currently moving, it is obviously going to uh, consistently and continuously become unaffordable for our people in South Africa. Uh, and we've seen, obviously, disposable income also becoming under a lot of pressure uh, with the, the recessionary uh, pressures that we have, uh, notwithstanding the fact that, you know, the Reserve Bank has given us uh, some 300 uh, you know, basis point reduction since the beginning of the year. But still, a lot of people still cannot afford, uh, you know, to buy a brand new vehicle. Uh, in South Africa, because those are very, very expensive. So I think, you know, it's a, it's a mixture of uh, those particular, uh, you know, challenges that we have. And I think we are definitely going to work harder to be able to make sure that we are uh, able to put South Africa on a, on a trajectory that will help us to be able to recover, because we cannot afford, um, you know, to spend uh, another year on a, on a recovery phase, because, I mean, I'm, I'm an economist and we've, we've, we've been doing some modeling uh, in the last two months and we're beginning to see, I mean, a lot of economists I've, I've, I've listened to, uh, they're saying South Africa is going to have a, either a V-shape recovery or a U-shape. What we are seeing from a NAMSA perspective, we're actually anticipating a W-shape uh, recovery where the situation will go down, up again, and then down again, uh, and then up again. And we've seen that also in terms of our numbers. If you compare, you know, from, from, um, uh, you know, from March this year, month-on-month uh, -month numbers, you are also beginning to see that w uh, recovery shape, and I think we, we're going to probably going to see that, uh, you know, taking shape uh, for 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 quite some time, uh, particularly for the balance of this year. 
Um, thanks for that, Mike. I think uh, two or three things for me that uh, uh, that resonate there. The first one is, um, you know, while the swing to used car is quite prominent um, at the moment, it is not a sustainable thing. And it's exactly what you're, you're speaking to. I mean, I'm not a proponent of a necessarily a swing to used car because um, there's, a, there's an inherent risk in a swing to used car, and that is an aging uh, fleet in the country. And we can't have an aging fleet because then we just become become older and older and older and uh, and the vehicle fleet in the in the country becomes less usable over time so uh, so I'm not a I'm not a massive proponent for a swing to used car it might be good for the used car market in the short term but it definitely is not sustainable so we need to stimulate new car sales um, because new car sales at the end of the day is the feeder into the used car environment and uh, unless that as as Richard put it that entire ecosystem works um, and everybody is growing, um, then we get to a sustainable future. We can't have a sustainable future if, if new car is on a decline and used car is on this massive you know, upward, uh, upward trend. It's just not sustainable in my mind because, uh, because of the aging fleet scenario. Um, but then, uh, you know, uh, talking to the, to the uh, uh, third point that you had there, Mike, the, um, uh, the tax uh, um, incentives that, uh, that is lacking in the country when it comes to, uh, uh, to new cars, um, particularly electric cars. Because we all know that the future of the world is uh, is in electric cars, and uh, and there's nothing at the moment that um, that supports that. There's no tax incentives. Uh, as a matter of fact, to import a electric vehicle is more expensive than to import an ICE vehicle. Um, not to mention the the lack of manufacture in the country of electric vehicles. Um, and I believe that we do have the technology and the know-how. Look, yesterday, Brad Binder, South African boy, won the uh, the Motor GP. South Africans can do this stuff. Elon Musk built the most uh, valuable uh, uh, car company in the world, a South African guy. And we can go on and on and on. South Africa has the capabilities, definitely uh, um, into the future. So so a lot of that resonates with me. But the, the one thing that, um, you know, might be uh, part of this future um, sustainability or change in the trend and, uh, you know, switching over to, to, to Richard's um, uh, opinion on this. Um, are there any other car buying trends that we're seeing from your research, Richard? And we pulled out a couple of um, a couple of points in the Auto Trader Industry Report that we we got from your research, and and some of your research shows that people are changing their attitudes and their behaviours. There are key financial concerns, a shift to online, car purchases have been delayed, online shopping, um, as uh, uh, as well as uh, businesses who are experienced in online shopping. You know, getting the lion's share. Share. But is there a general trend towards the change in ownership type? So, for instance, car rentals, uh, uh, not only the rent to buy environment, but also sustainable car rentals. Uh, you know, what, what are the main things in that area that you got out of the research? So we didn't actually research that deeply, but I can talk to it quite broadly. And I think um, I think the first thing, the point that Mike makes about the tax, etc., and as well as the, you make a very good point about. You know, the used car market has got to get stock and you only get stock from a from a from new car sales. So for me, it's about I think there are two fundamental consumer issues we've got to we've got to look at here in terms of the demand for, for vehicles for stock. And I'm talking about private ownership. I'm not talking about people who are using public transport. Um, we have to a make vehicles more affordable. That doesn't mean we need to drop the price. We've just got to make them more affordable. So the price is obviously playing a big role. And if you look at 42% of, of it being taxed or whatever without rebates, et cetera, that's the first thing. So we've got to look at how we change affordability. Transformation in the industry, back to your point, Mike, in terms of um, the racial demographic, that's happened. It's done. It's been. Um, the demographic profile of vehicle owners in South Africa largely represents the, the broader demographic profile of, of South Africans. But we have to reach deeper um, because it, the vehicle is in South Africa and will remain for quite a long time a sign of posterity, a sign of achievement, a sign of status, um, and just the ability to move yourself is critical for many people in our country. It's different. You've got control, you've got space, you've got safety, um, you've got flexibility, all of those kinds of things. So I think affordability is the first thing. Going hand in hand with that, is the, the very strong move we've seen towards people 
becoming more, not price sensitive necessarily, but value driven and questioning their purchases, delaying, stopping, et cetera, et cetera. On top of that, because of COVID and the fact that, I mean, my brother-in-law works for a financial consulting business. Um, he was told to come and fetch his stuff from the office. They found this home office thing works brilliantly. Um, you no longer have an office. You've got meeting rooms, but now you work from home, finished. They just, you know, they wrote off I don't know how many millions of, of rental for, for floor space. So mobility needs are going to shift. Um, and then the third issue to that is the whole electric vehicle thing. So in South Africa, we've seen quite a low, a limited take up because we're not always the most, we express lip service towards environmental friendliness, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, as long as it's more expensive to be environmentally friendly than it is um, to drive a nice vehicle, um, we're not going to. <laughs> we're simply not going to. We want our Vs. Um, so I think the, and, and I think the other last point is that the OEMs have shown an appetite to invest in this country. Um, so I don't think there's a lack of desire from some of the bigger, o, you know, the international OEMs. I don't, there's no lack of desire to put cash into some of our, um, um, and, and build factories and build production units and, and um, et cetera. So I think it, it does come down to quite a joint effort between, uh, across the whole auto industry, which Nance is going to have to drive quite strongly with government to make this whole, to give it a different shape and to keep, retain more revenue within, within the South African borders and, you know, obviously give more employment. So I think there's a massive role to play there. And then we get to the mobility thing, which is the customer piece and then the whole deal and dealer issue, et cetera, et cetera, which we can speak to separately. Well, I mean, uh, uh, thanks, Richard. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I think, uh, uh, you know, come out of that for me is, um, is uh, a small thing you mentioned there, which is uh, consumers now um, are potentially going to be more reliant on their motor vehicles in the future. And uh, and some of the, the, the Google study that we, that we uh, got, got in the automotive industry report um, speaks to the fact that people feel safe in their cars. You know, uh, yeah. traveling via aircraft or via public transport to go on holiday, potentially in the future is going to be something done with your vehicle because you have the safety of your vehicle for, uh, you know, a seven-hour trip to, to KZN as opposed to, uh, you know, a one-hour trip in a 150-person tin can. Um, so, so chances are that uh, in the future we're going to be um, shifting our, our transport for holidays um, um, into our cars. Um, but, uh, Mike, is the South African automotive industry, to Richard's, Richard's other point, um, is the South African automotive industry from a retail, manufacture and importing point of view changing fast enough? Are we really changing fast enough to capture the change in this trend or the change in that W trend that you, uh, um, or the W shape that you refer to? Well, look, I think, um, George, I think to, to Richard's point, um, there is commitment to accelerate the change. Um, the change is happening, but whether it is have, it's happening fast enough, I think that's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a subjective issue and a matter that, uh, might be different to whoever is looking at the issue. Our view is that at least there's commitment, uh, you know, there's determination to be able to shift, uh, you know, those trends uh, faster than, you know, they've done uh, previously. And I think some of the change will obviously be forced change. It's not something that uh, OEMs and importers will have the luxury uh, to, uh, you know, succumb to the change at the pace at which they want. Uh, it's definitely going to be forced change. I mean, let's take, for example, the issue around electric vehicle uh, evolution, for example. I think South Africa is definitely going to be forced, uh, you know, by the trends around the world uh, to move into electric vehicles. Uh, and I'll give you an example. I mean, currently we're producing more than uh, 600,000 units in the country. 64% of what we're producing goes out of the country. We're not selling... Uh, you know, the, those in, in, in South Africa, we're actually exporting it uh, to many countries. And many countries have already given us notice. I mean, if you look at Scandinavian countries, for an example, they've indicated very clearly that they will no longer, in the next three to five years, they will no longer accept our internal combustion engines uh, in, their, in their markets. Um, and because our biggest trading partner, in fact, as South Africa, the majority of that 64% that we export actually goes into Europe. Um, and Europe is obviously putting very stringent measures in terms of the environment targets, the environmental target, a reduction of CO2 emissions, uh, and so on and so forth. So South African automotive 
and manufacturers are going to be forced. If they want to continue doing business with Europe, they're going to be forced in the next, particularly for their next cycle um, you know, of their vehicle uh, models, they are going to be forced to be able to innovate even faster to be able to move into electric vehicles. Um, and that's why as NAMSA, we've just now completed a study. We did a, a very comprehensive study on uh, the impact of electric vehicles in South Africa. And we've looked at five key issues, uh, which and amongst other things include, uh, you know, the regulatory environment in South Africa. Is it fertile enough to be able to push for electric vehicles to be introduced in the country? We've looked at issues around production. Is South Africa ready to produce uh, its first electric vehicles in the country? We've looked at infrastructure. Currently, our infrastructure is not compatible uh, you've got four brands currently in the market. We know as NAMSA, we've already been given notice by the manufacturers themselves that by the end of this year, we'll have 11 uh, you know, uh, units uh, or different brands in the market. We know Mini has, has just launched two weeks ago uh, their, their, their new uh, electric vehicle uh, model. Uh, VW has done the same. And many other brands are coming into South Africa, obviously, notwithstanding some of the challenges that we have with COVID-19. But the notice we received at the beginning of the year is that by the end of 2020, we should be having about 11 EV brands in the market. Um, and, and we're also looking at that issue of infrastructure because our charging infrastructure currently is not compatible. Um, and, and a lot of manufacturers are worried about uh, the introduction because a Jaguar Land Rover, for an example, has introduced you know, specific uh, measures uh, to be able to make sure that their brand, when they brought it into the country, is able to be charged chargeable uh, across the different uh, sectors and so on and areas and so on and so forth. So, so we are already looking at um, you know, electric vehicle evolution in the country. And like I said, George, I think it's going to be a forced uh, you know, movement uh, you know, on certain aspects of, 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 of uh, how fast, as you said, um, you know, uh, people can be able to, um, you know, to change to this new uh, evolution that we are looking at. And I think to a, to a large extent, it's not going to be because um, you know it was in the plan, but uh, people are going to adapt to the changes that uh, the market is definitely going going through. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I I definitely agree with the with the forced bit because uh, just like the swing from new to used and the aging fleet, um, you know, at the end of the day, as, as a country, uh, we are assemblers of cars. You know, we're, uh, we're, we we don't design them, so that means we are largely um, in the hands of uh, Europe, Japan. Um, and uh, you know, in some parts of the, the, the uh, some of the other eastern parts of uh, of the world, so um, so if if those countries go full electric, we are forced to go full electric. Otherwise, we run the risk of again having an aging ice fleet. Um, so uh, so we have to get our A into G and uh, and begin manufacturing locally because uh, that's uh, that's gonna that's gonna turn this W trend around hopefully and uh, and then charging infrastructure. I mean. I've driven a couple of the uh, the electric cars, uh, the BMW i3, uh, Jaguar gave me the the iPace to drive uh, to drive for a week, and uh, um, and it, it on a normal house plug socket, it takes more than overnight to charge that car. So the electric charging infrastructure in the country is a is a vital one, and I look forward to to reading that report and uh, you know look out for it if you're listening to this. Look out for for the for the report uh, that Namsa and um, and Mike Mabasa is talking about on the electric uh, vehicles uh, in South Africa because it is a big part of our future. Let's shift gears a little bit, uh, and gentlemen. And finally, you know the final topic which I'm passionate about, and uh, and maybe Richard, we can we can talk to you first uh, with regard to this topic, and that is. Um, live market data, you know, in a in a in an environment where the internet drives transparency and uh, and uh, and more and more consumers get their hands on data, uh, being demand, supply, and price data just purely from the internet, and uh, and then and I call that dumb data. And then we get uh, the situation where that dumb data is turned into intelligent data, but it's still nonetheless transparent. Um, and uh, industries, products, whether it be motor vehicles or retail or uh, it doesn't matter what it is, um, in years gone by, um, industries and, uh, and businesses could push their products onto consumers. 
They could design, manufacture, and push those products onto consumers. And it was no different in the car industry in the past, where uh, a designer would come up with a design and that car would be manufactured and pushed onto the industry. Yes, there would be research and there would be consumer um, insights. And, and uh, you know, I'm not saying that the consumer wasn't involved. But in the world of transparency, are we moving to a place where the consumer is in control of demand more so than they've ever been? Absolutely. I mean, you always heard the saying, customer is king. Um, well, a customer is more king today or more queen today or more whatever you want to call it today than, than ever before. Um, because it's not just about service. It's about the whole, it's about this whole transparency thing. And what customers are looking for, I mean, what we as South Africans are looking for more than anything is, is about trust and about confidence. Because there are so few things that we do trust in our market. So you can talk, and I'm not going to get political, anything like it, but you can talk to government, you can talk to police, you can talk to big institutions, you can talk to schooling, you can talk to medical, you can talk to anything. Um, we are in a dire shortage of trust. Um, you can't even trust the person standing next to you at the ATM. Um, we are a, a, so we are looking for confidence and trust. And transparency builds confidence, it builds trust. So the ability to get as much clarity and as much transparency as possible at a customer level really adds to the whole relationship thing because it means that the, 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 the producer or the, whoever is marketing it is being open, is being honest. And if they're not, the customer will catch you out very, very quickly because it's available. The data is there. And so I think it's not a bad thing. I think it's the, 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 indus, the, 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 um, the marketers and the brands who use it best and who understand it best are going to be able to fit that whole ecosystem together where they match their brand to their product, to their customer, and very importantly, all the way through to their delivery. And I think what we are looking at are two things in the South African automotive market. New is one thing because new, you kind of buy off a, off a list. So there's some brands that you buy, it's all in and there's a, 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 there's a retail price that's what you pay and you get all of this stuff others you add on whatever it might be um, but you're buying a car from a brand and you've done your research on that and that needs to be transparent and you've obviously got financing and trade trade-ins etc the second part of that is the new is the used car market where you're not buying just a car you're buying history um it's like dating someone for the first time you know what's their history <laughs> you know where's where's this been um and and so the whole trust issue um comes into a lot more. And the pricing is not the same. Um, you're looking at a whole lot of different elements. So again, um, and dealers are both, dealers are trading new and used cars and they've got to maintain that very transparent issue. And then the, the last piece of that is the financing deal. Um, it's become so complex and so difficult and so hard to understand um, that we really have to walk our consumers through that journey and make everything from cradle to grave absolutely seamless on brand and all in the customer's interests thanks richard mike you uh, uh you know one of your uh, um, uh, topics that i've uh, spoken to you about before has been uh, uh, transparency what, what do you think transparency and how do you think transparency plays out in the automotive industry uh, um, in the future and how vital do you think it is well, look, transparency is absolutely important for for the automotive industry and i think one of the issues um, I've looked at very carefully and will continue to look at uh, is data management. We believe very strongly, I mean, from an AMSA perspective, that there's an opportunity for us uh, to make a lot of data that we have uh, available to the market. Because currently, you know, NAMSA is hosting such an amount uh, of data, um, you know, imaginable, uh, particularly uh, as it relates to the automotive industry. And we barely share that information out with the public. And, and I think, you know, to your point in relation to transparency, we need to be able to make such information available uh, in order for people to be able to make, uh, you know, informed decisions about, uh, you know, vehicles that are in the market and what they can be able to, um, you know, use those vehicles. Um, and I think to Richard's point, um, you know, to be able to also have a, a direct interaction uh, with the, um, you know, with the with the with the vehicle that you, you're actually buying, and and I think what we are what we are going to be introducing, uh, hopefully in the next couple of months, uh, is what we call an auto CV, 
uh, where we are going to be talking specifically to um, you know, a, a CV of a vehicle. From the, from the time that vehicle is rolled out of the production line or it is delivered at the port of entry uh, as an imported vehicle into the country uh, and right through so that you, as a, as a customer, you are able to know the history of this car, uh, how many times it was serviced, by whom, how many replacement parts were in, included in that particular vehicle. That data is already there. It's available to us, uh, but we're not making that information available right through up until that vehicle gets what we call a death certificate uh, when that car is scrapped out of, the, out of the system. So transparency is very, very important. And we will be introducing AutoCV uh, very, very soon. Uh, I know that our developers are currently busy uh, putting that together and I'm hoping, I don't want to steal their thunder, uh, but I'm certainly that we will certainly be able to make sure that uh, that data uh, is available to the market as soon as possible. Because data is the new currency. Uh, and without data, uh, you know, this new fourth industrial revolution that we're all talking about will not come to pass. Uh, it, it has to be driven by data. And I think data is going to be very important. Definitely, definitely. And there, there you have it uh, uh, from Mike Mabasa, um, another innovation in the in the automotive industry and, uh, and, and some good things being done. Well, um, that's a wrap, gentlemen. Any, uh, any final thoughts, Richard? No, I, just, I, I think, you know, the industry stands at a crossroads. It's, I think the bottom line is dealers have, have, have sold cars and service cars the same way for, a, like Mike says, 100 years. Um, I've always said that's got to change and not, it hasn't. It, it's going to change now. And I think the industry from a data point of view, exactly to both of your points, they need to own that or someone else will. Um, the, the big data companies, whoever they might be, and I won't mention any names, we know who they all are, they will own it. Um, and then you'll be left, you know, you, you'll be left behind. So the industry has got to take that and grow the industry. And then at a secondary level, they've got to fight for their slice of the pie. But unless the pie grows or you keep it at a relatively high level, um, everyone is going to, everyone's going to lose. But I think the, the future, I think, looks good. Um, and Mike, certainly from what I'm hearing from you, it's sounding, it's sounding very promising, um, certainly from a legislative and from a regulatory point of view. And, uh, and, uh, and, then, uh, and then finally, Richard uh, Kantar, uh, any, any future kind of uh, insights that you can share uh, uh, that, uh, that people can look out for? Yeah, well, we're doing a lot of this COVID work, so we're trying to we're trying to understand. We're also doing some future futuristic stuff. So we look at all the different markets across the globe, and we're using our analytics guys to have a look at how they have turned. So to Mark's point, is it going to be a W, a V, or a U? Um, so we're looking across different industries. We're using analytics to see how people who come out of it, you know, the New Zealand, well, not so much New Zealand, a very small market, but China, etc. How those markets are breaking out as as the COVID peak drops. Um, we're not looking at America just yet. Um, but it is giving us a very good sense as to how, what kind of trends have remained um, and will remain into the future, um, what are going to swing back to what they were, um, and what the shape of, of people's spend is actually going to look like relative to their confidence and, and their ability to and their ability to actually um, to, to spend differently, etc. What will stay and what will change um, fundamentally for, for a very long time? Yeah, what will the new normal look like? Well, there you have it from Richard Rice from Kantar. Uh, what will the new normal look like? Business Development Director, and uh, and uh, I'm fortunate to have had him on this uh, industry talk. And then uh, any final thoughts, Mike? Well, look, George, I think the COVID-19, obviously, with all its challenges and um, you know misfortunes that it has brought to the world, I think it was something that we needed as a society. Um, I call it a, brick, a, a big reset button, uh, because I think this uh, button, um, depending obviously on how you embrace it, uh, is definitely going to change the world. And it has, in fact, changed the world in, in many ways than one. Um, we believe very strongly, and I say, as I said earlier on, that the industry is going to change faster in the next 10 years than it has in the, in the, in the last 100. Um, and I think, you know, post-COVID-19, once... Uh, you know, everything has come back to, um, you know, normal. Um, you know, th certain things will certainly not be the same again. And I think we will certainly be seeing a lot of changes into the future. And uh, we look forward to, you know, a lot of innovation coming through in the industry, a lot of uh, debates, a lot of discussions. Uh, and I think, you know, we should keep on uh, going with this uh, discussion so that we can really be able to see how best 
we can be able to take the industry to the next level. Thank you very much, Mike. And uh, there you have it, uh, Mike Mabasa from uh, NAMSA CEO and uh, speaking about the big reset button. So uh, thank you, gentlemen. I've been fortunate enough to be joined by uh, two industry uh, leaders and uh, some innovations going on in the industry. And I'm passionate about it. I, uh, I want to see South Africa acting doing things that are up there with the first world countries, and I definitely think we're capable. So uh, from an industry talk perspective, see you all next time.